Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're looking at the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series, entitled Major Lessons from Minor Prophets, is for the months of April through June of 2013. This particular lesson is number three, and it covers one of those minor prophets, the prophet Joel. It's entitled, A Holy and Just God. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer, and as soon as we've done that, grab your Bible. I think you'll find it interesting. Open up to Joel, and we'll discuss it together. But first, let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, these small books near the end of the Old Testament have some powerful messages. Help us to see what's there, to think along with the prophets, to understand this situation as far as possible, and where possible, may we learn lessons that apply to us in our day, as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. To get an introduction to the book of Joel, you simply need to read the first six verses. Let me do that right now. I'm reading from the Good News translation. This is the Lord's message to Joel, son of Pethuel. Now, unfortunately, that's the only very specific biographical information we have in the whole book. Pay attention, you older people. E everyone in Judah, listen. Has anyone like this ever happened? Anything like this ever happened? In your time or the time of your ancestors? Tell your children about it. They will tell their children who will in turn will tell the next generation. Swarm after swarm of locusts settle on the crops. What one swarm left, the next swarm devoured. Wake up and weep, you drunkards. Cry, you wine drinkers, the grapes for making new wine have been destroyed. An army of locusts has attacked our land. They are powerful and too many to count. Their teeth are as sharp as those of a lion. So that's what the lesson is about. And Joel seems to think we're supposed to learn something from that lesson. Dennis? Is, is this a metaphor or is he referring to a literal experience? Well, that's one of the big discussions about the book of Joel. Some people have suggested that maybe this is a metaphor for military invasions of some kind. Um, Your version uh, didn't name any specific types of worms four, like this one do. Yeah. Are those words for the, for the same creature or? Yeah, different stages in the life cycle of the same creature. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Is there a... Uh, is there a specific reason why he mentions drunkards and? and well, they is, seem is to this, be. Is this an Is this a, an allu uh, uh, an intimation of perhaps uh, the condition of the country here? Is it? Is he saying that? We're, know, we're gonna we're gonna look at that in a moment. So bear bear with me. For those of you who may not have an idea what we're talking about. I've got some pictures up here. I can't blow them up. This is internet pictures, but these are like giant grasshoppers that are about four to five inches long. And they are noisy when they fly. They, are, they will destroy anything in their wake. And we'll, um, we'll look at some comments about- Anything um, that's green. Anything that's green, basically. And, all, and some things that are connected to things that are green. <laughs> So they destroy it by devouring. Yes, right? they, they just they devour eat. everything. So Joel is trying to tell us this kind of disaster needs to tell us something. Why are these disasters happening to God's holy people? That shouldn't be happening, right? Well, in order to understand any writing, whether it's ancient or modern, you need to know as much as possible about the context. Now, there's no mention in the book of Joel of a king. That seems strange because kings were the standard in those days. Uh, on the basis of that lack of information, which is a, an argument from silence, which isn't a very powerful argument, but scholars have tended to think that perhaps it was during the reign of Joash, remember the child king Joash in the 19th, in the 9th century BC, other people suggested, well, maybe it was during the reign of the child king Josiah in the 7th century BC. Some people even want to put it after the exile, way down maybe the 4th century or 5th century 
BC. And each of them have some evidence for their, for their view, but have, nothing conclusive. Right. The evidence for the post-exilic, the, the after the exile thing, is that some of the members of the great synagogue, or sometimes called the great assembly, um, said that these last 12 books of the Minor Prophets were written or put together by people in their day. Now, we know that some of the books were not put together in their day, so you have to read that with a grain of salt. It may be that they were just put together, because in the Hebrew Bibles, they're put together, all 12 of these Minor Prophets are put together as a single scroll. So maybe it just means that they put the 12 together as a single book. That may be what that means. But for whatever it's worth, in the Babylonian Talmud, they suggest it's, it's a late date. Our Seventh Adventist commentary, for reasons of having looked at all the information that's available, suggest they think it was probably the seventh century date, which means sometime after the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed and sometime before the southern kingdom was went into exile. So somewhere in that span of time is when we think it probably happened. It's interesting to notice another piece of information that Joel is clearly known and referred to by Jesus and the apostles. Um, take an example, look at Mark 13, 24, where it says, in the days after that time of trouble, the sun will grow dark and the moon will no longer shine. And Joel is the first one who talks about the sun turning dark and the moon no longer, I mean, the sun no longer shining, the moon, moon turning to blood and so forth in, in his reference. So, and the most famous reference to it, of course, is Peter's sermon in Acts 2, where he talks about the outpouring of the Spirit on the older and the younger and so forth, and we'll get more details of that a little bit later. Paul talks about it in Romans 10, 13. So usually these references from the book of Joel that came from 600 plus years before Christ are used in the context where people are talking about events at the end of the world, for whatever reason. So why is that? Isn't there some, these things were for, were written for those upon whom the ends of the <coughs> earth are come? Possible. So that's probably a good idea. They're <laughs> not unreasonable then. Well, he talks a lot about the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And what is the day of the Lord? Well. Uh, without going into a lot of detail, in the early days, in the days of David and Solomon as kings, the children of Israel looked forward to the glorious day when, when their, their kingdom would expand and they would basically rule the world. After the decline and finally the Babylonian exile and all that kind of stuff, they came back and they realized there was never going to be a time when they were, by their natural growth or their natural military ability, going to be able to rule any significant portion of the world. It's never going to happen. So they started talking about the day when the Messiah would come and he would miraculously give them the power to regain their former glory. And that miraculous transformation was known as the day of the Lord. So when you said they started talking about, this sounds like, it sounds like that they believe something else, and when that wasn't manifesting, why well, they concocted something else to believe. Well, they just recognized that, you know, they're, this small group of them that came back from Babylonian <clears throat> captivity, 50,000 or so, were never going to be another David and his kingdom when they were ruled a major part of the Middle East. Not going to happen. Well, yeah, to, come they, to, a to come to the place where you realize that something isn't going to happen, or your understanding has been an error, it's time either to find more information or concoct something. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> what, what you're saying here is that they searched a little more and they found the correct information rather than, well, concocted something. No, actually they concocted something. Oh, well. And that's... Well, that's my that's, goodness, that's, that's not going to go over well on our broadcast. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying we know that for a ma as a they matter of fact... They concocted the Messiah? No, no, they concocted their version of the Messiah. 
Now, Which who, was, who are we talking about they here? This we're is talking a, about the after Jewish they come people, back? the Jewish people between the days of Malachi at the end of the Old Testament and the arrival of the true Messiah. Does and, that include Joel here? Well, some people thought Joel happened there, but we believe Joel happened 400 years before that. Or so something. when I read this, or I read some of these minor prophets and so forth, then I'm reading they, things they've concocted? No, 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 no. All of these minor prophets were done, written long before that mm. concoction stuff started. Do you oh, think? okay. But what, I mean, don't sound like this is something strange. <laughs> you know that in the New Testament, what they expected for the Messiah to do was very different than what Jesus did. Right. So that's where that very strange well, but idea that, about... That has been they were a problem since the days of Adam. No, 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 no. Wait, isn't there isn't there some evidence for for looking at it that way? Looking at at this coming of this Messiah as a general type thing. Well, what happened? What happened was this. If you look at the Old Testament and particularly these books of the minor minor prophets, Zechariah in particular, you're going to find there are in Isaiah and Ezekiel there are prophecies about how if they follow the Lord miraculous things will happen and, 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 and the Lord the Messiah will come back and and he will rule the world and all that kind of stuff and we now understand those prophecies to be connected with the second coming of Christ but the people in the Old Testament did not know anything about a second coming of Christ they put all of those events together they figured the Messiah is going to come one time he's going to conquer the world he's going to rule the world all those things are going to happen with his first coming did they, did they make a mistake by doing that? Or yeah. is there enough? Yeah, but isn't there enough? How do you know that there's enough information that there's back there, that there's two There wasn't comings? enough information. That well, there then how would they make a mistake? Because they're going by the best evidence that they have. They chose to interpret it in a way that they wanted. They wanted a dream that somehow or other they would once again rule the world. Well, what other explanation could there have been? That would that would come up with a, a messiah. explanation. Yeah, I know. They didn't want that. I know, but I don't see anything written down that way that would lead them to that kind of spiritual um, interpretation. Oh yeah, there's plenty of. Well, things. yeah, after Jesus comes and then it actually happens, then you can kind of put it together. I mean, from from yeah. looking at the hindsight, there's a lot of stuff that you can do, but. Going back to the, before Jesus came, I, how can you put all that together that way and get that spiritual? I, I, I understand it was, it would, it, it's much more, it's much more appealing to normal human beings to take that kind of an approach, and I wouldn't fault them. It's the question more, is this: Why did God not make it clear to them? It's more appealing to expect a conqueror and a king rather than a suffering servant. Exactly. Also, could Joel have been written like this with no real date that can be pinned down in God's wisdom so that it speaks to people in God's people in different times about the day of the Lord and about following God so that you have a blessed life or as much as possible? I mean, maybe yes. it's God's will that there's nothing in this Joel book to pin down a date. Well, we're going to find out that there's other books that have nothing that can be pinned down. If mm -hmm. they had gone over the text that Jesus went over with the people on the road to Emmaus, yeah. mm -hmm. if they had understood those, if they had taken a spiritual view of those texts that they had available to them, they would have anticipated that Christ would have come. They would have recognized him. Mm -hmm. But instead, they had this idea that they were going to be rulers of the earth. And it covered all of those things that they looked at. That's and well, if the Messiah comes in, though, if their Messiah comes in as the ruler of the earth, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't it just follow that they would be the rulers of the earth? I mean, if they're the people well, of God... And he is going to come and rule the earth. He's going to be here's, king. Here's the, He's going to be the, the one that will have all the nations under his feet. But so here you, go, the, here you go. How do you put that together? Here's, without, here's the problem. All through the Old Testament, it makes very clear that there are spiritual conditions for every one of those times. 
and they completely ignored those spiritual conditions. So you can say, yes, you know, they said, we want all the privileges, but don't talk to us about the responsibilities. That's, that's when you guys line. say they, you're talking about <coughs> the, people Jewish, of Israel. the people of Israel before well, the, peop the, the, the Jews after the Babylonian captivity. Dennis. Well, isn't, uh, isn't uh, Isaiah 53, that chapter, isn't that the classic example of what we're talking about? Yes. Here we, we look back and we say that that can identify no one but Jesus Christ. Yet when they read it, they applied it to themselves. Yeah, they applied it to the Jewish nation to the nation. So it's, it's how they understood and interpreted uh, and applied what was written. Yeah. Well, let's read a little bit about what happens when a plague of locusts comes along, or a plague of any kind. I'm going to read, first of all, just a few words from the introduction to the book of Joel found in the Message Bible. When disaster strikes, understanding of God is at risk. Unexpected illness or death, national catastrophe, social disruption, personal loss, plague or epidemic, devastation by flood or drought, t turn men and women who haven't given God a thought in years, and that's what we've been talking about, into, in, into instant theologians. Rumors fly. God is absent. God is angry. God is playing favorites, and I'm not the favorite. God is ineffectual. God is holding a grudge from a long time ago, and now we're paying for it, and so forth. Which sounds like what Joel is saying. Yes. In our day, it's interesting to notice that the liberal, even atheistic news media call for prayers when there's a national or natural or national disaster. I mean, the people who talk about evolution and all how this kind of stuff, and then all of a sudden, 9-11 happens and everybody's calling for prayers. Who are you going to pray to? The slime? <laughs> I mean, give me a break. They need to be consistent here. Ba well, but times not of, all the same people, though. Well, but that times of be. disaster make people want to turn to some supernatural source of help. Who, is el who else is available except God? There are no atheists in a foxhole. Is Something that a like that. Term? <laughs> so as you read the book of Joel, especially those verses we just read, does it seem like God is the one who sent the plague of locusts? Well, something seems strange because didn't he say that this has never happened before? Mm -hmm. Is that true? Well, probably, maybe, that probably not Noah, to that extent. No, to the, that to that no extent. other time that locust has gone through the land and just ate everything up. It was a really bad plague, let's put it that way. And the question is, you, on times like this, you might look back and see what the scripture says. And I turn to, to Deuteronomy 28, verse 38. You will sow plenty of seed. Now, this isn't, remember, Deuteronomy at the end here talks about the blessings and the curses. And what's the difference between the blessings and the curses? Depending on their behavior. <laughs> Depends on their behavior. The spiritual conditions. Kind of like what we were talking about a few moments ago, isn't it? Isn't that works? Well, no, it just means you, they, you, you want to have a... You want to have a you, right if, relationship with God. If you if you do the right things and your and so forth, then things work out. God is on your side. That sounds like salvation and righteousness by works. Well, listen to this here, verse and see how you interpret it. Here it says, O lament, O priest, wail, O ministers of the altar, come spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, for the grain offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Does that mean they withheld their offerings? And Joel is saying, well, this is coming upon you? Yes. But now let me read my verse from, okay. from Deuteronomy 28, 38. Here's what happens if you don't <coughs> maintain your relationship with God. You will sow plenty of seed, but reap only a small harvest, because the locusts will eat your crops. So that Does that sound like God did it? we discussed in here before that just because a tornado comes doesn't mean wipes out everything that that doesn't mean that's what necessarily God I'm coming just, after those people because they're naughty I'm just asking you know there's a lot of people on the news that, that come on and make their little statement when there's a disaster that happens they say it's because of God not blessing this country anymore, that they're going down the tubes and that's why 
That's why we're getting all these. Well, these they, they can cite Job here as a perfect example of. Well, that's true. <coughs> I mean, Joel. Yeah, Joel, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, Joel talks about a plague of locusts. Amos is going to talk about an earthquake. And the earthquake apparently was so severe that they were still talking about it 250 years later. So these are pretty major events, I think. And, and when something disastrous like that happens, I mean, we all know this. Think about your personal experience in the last few years. When a big disaster happens, what does everybody do? Well, Talk about God. It happened at 9-11. Sure. Just over and over. They go back and they quote Joel. So I ask my question again. Nobody's dared to answer it yet. Does God send natural disasters? Evidently. Uh, that's, it does. Evidently, well, Joel question, says so. Would, now everybody wants to talk. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> One at a time. That's a, a, a good question, which I think Adventists in many places have not really come to grips with. Mm -hmm. uh, I have had so many experiences where Oh, the Hurricane C Katrina mm -hmm. was God's judgment on the New Orleans homosexual behavior, everything that went on in New Orleans. Uh, yet there are quotes, and I was looking for one a few minutes ago, where Ellen White says that all evil comes from Satan, that God is not the source of evil, that God is only the source of right and righteousness. So if we see things like these disasters come on, why do we jump to the picture of God which suggests he's raised his hand in anger when there's also the description that he's turned his face, mm -hmm. that he's let us go, he's let go of us, Okay. Uh, that he ha that that we have crawled out from under his protecting hand, and we can expect the devil's wrath. Okay, let's look at that. Go ahead. Uh, there, there is a sense, though, that nothing happens down here that doesn't get past his passive will. Okay, and so and I think that's why he takes responsibility for the whole sin episode, and and comes and provides a salvation. And, and he says, I'm going to fix this thing that went wrong. I'm going to provide a way. So did he cause this, the first sin? No, I don't think so. But he set the conditions in which it could happen, and he let it happen. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about the flood. Who sent the flood? And who sent the ten plagues on Egypt? I mean, look at, look at Exodus 12, verse 12. On that night I, this is the Lord speaking, I will go through the land of Egypt, killing every firstborn male, both human and animal, and punishing all the gods of Egypt. I am Yahweh. Can we, Did he do it or didn't he do it? Yeah. Can we uh, determine why God, these things that he said he did, why he did them according to the Bible, rather than out of our heads think about why God did that? Yes, we're, we're going to... I'm going to look at, we're going to look at it in a little bit later. He's going to say in Deuteronomy 8.15, these snakes that were biting the Israelites at that point in time, they were there all along. But because you turned away from me, I no longer protected you from the snakes. Well, that was the snakes. We're talking about the plagues. <laughs> <laughs> well, God sent them. I'm, I'm saying God sent the flood. God sent the... See, we have to think about this. We know, can't just make a blanket answer. We have to think about what's going on here. But when God protects you, you can be in the middle of a fiery furnace and still survive. That's right. So if God is protecting you, you can be in the middle of a bunch of locusts and they won't touch your field. Mm -hmm. let, let me read you I about the locusts. I don't see that very often, though. So, of course, my, my, my uh, father-in-law, he experienced a, a hailstorm that went on, his, on the opposite side of the road of his farm and wiped out the one on this side of the road, but his was okay, type mm -hmm. of thing. That now the other thing that happened is that later on, that hailstorm came back and wiped his out too. So, but but, but there, it, it was very impressive, you know, the time <laughs> between the hailstorms right there. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Dennis Dennis. is being so courteous that yeah. he raises his hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the examples that you have pointed out in the past is what happened at the, 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 the foot of Mount Sinai yeah. when the children of Israel were dancing around uh, the golden calf and behaving like the, the, the people of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And the question is, uh, uh, well, God's command was, uh, take your sword, kill your, your friend, your brother, your neighbor, mm -hmm. and 7,000, uh, uh, 7,000, 3,000. 3,000. 3,000, 3,000 uh, Israelites died at the hand of the Levites. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, why would God order them to do that? And Ellen White weighs in very clearly on that subject, that if he had not no. stepped in, if he had not required <coughs> that that sin be blotted out, mm -hmm. if he had let it go, it would have resulted in the same experience that was demonstrated with Cain, when Cain was permitted to live on after killing his brother. And we know what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we went down to the flood when there was just one man left. So God is eliminating yep. that evil influence and in doing so is protecting his people from the disaster that he so ably demonstrated before yeah. the flood. Yeah. Um, if I may? Yes. I think we've moved really far. Before God was all fire and brimstone, now we're changing God. We're making him this really docile, oh, oh, let's all, you know, that doesn't punish any parent who just allow everything to happen is not a good parent. God, uh, God is a parent. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he has to dole out discipline. We may not like the discipline. We may think it's harsh from our point of view, but I believe God allows or causes those things to happen because we cannot pick up what we choose from the Bible because it says in the Bible, he does allow this, mm -hmm. he does this. Yeah. So I believe he does. It's interesting, you use two words there. Mm -hmm. He allows or causes. Yeah. Aren't those quite different? <laughs> well, well, again, it depends whether you're talking about a sovereign who has absolute control. Yes. If a person yes. has absolute control, then allowing and causing are not that much different. Not. Well, but aren't, I mean, aren't there there's some things that are just the natural consequences of the things mm -hmm. that that we do. Um, and how do we tell those from when God is acting, he's actually chasing you with a sword, or whether... Um, um, he is letting it happen. Well, you know, I came to <coughs> Loma Linda in the 70s when my mom had cancer, and... Uh, went into the ward with cancer. And I remember one of the saddest things I saw was a Adventist doctor in a wheelchair and he had brain cancer. And he was so sad and, well, he was hardly able to speak. And I remember the people trying to talk to him. He must have been well known. And you just cannot say something like that or the whole hospital situation is something that God uses to discipline. I mean, there, there's, there's a multitude of reasons, and it just, I feel so uncomfortable yeah. thinking some of these things happen as God's discipline. Yeah. Let, me, let me read a few words about what the plague is really like that, that uh, Joel was telling us about. As an illustration of a severe locust plague, and by the way, if you like these illustrations, once again, they're found on our website, uh, theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Look under the teacher's guide for the book of Joel, or you can look under our Sabbath school uh, handouts for this quarter. As an illustration of a severe locust plague in Palestine, the report of an eyewitness, H. Sneller, director of the Syrian orphanage in Jerusalem, is here presented, and I quote, we had a famine the second year of the war, that is in 1915, it was talking about the First World War, such as we had not experienced in 50 years. 
The sky was darkened by the gigantic swarms of locusts which covered the whole country, and neither sun nor moon could be seen. All of Palestine was transformed into a desert within a few days. All trees from their tops to the ground, including the bark, were eaten up clean. Our vegetable gardens, cultivated with so much labor, disappeared as if by magic. <laughs> the following spring there crept forth from hundreds of billions of eggs the new brood, which consumed the little that had been left. The result was a terrific famine written in 1925, recalling the, that particular example. When locusts enter the gregarious swarming stages, they can migrate great distances. They have been observed 1,200 miles out at sea. The total size of the swarm can be huge, can, containing up to 120 million insects per square mile. In 1889, a swarm across the Red Sea covered 2,000 square miles, one huge swarm. To prevent an outbreak of locusts in Cyprus in 1881, uh, egg cases totaling a net weight, think about the size of, an, uh, of a grasshopper egg case. Now these are big grasshoppers, we said they're like four to five inches long, and the females burrow in the ground and they lay this egg case. You know, each one of them weighs a tenth of an ounce or something like that. They, in Cyprus alone, in 1881, egg cases totaling a net worth of 1,300 tons were dug up by hand. 1,300 tons. Did they burn them or of, throw them into the probably. sea? Or? Not having experienced such a phenomenon, we can only faintly sense the horror of having a swarming, hopping, sun-darkening, chewing mass descend on your land. In 1915, journalist John D. Whiting stood almost where Joel stood, Joel stood in Jerusalem and recorded the following words, sudden darkening of the bright sunshine, uh, clouds so dense as to appear quite black. In an inconceivably short time, every leaf is consumed, leaving, bark, leaving bare and bark twigs only. It seemed as if the entire surface of the ground moved, producing a most curious effect upon one's vision, causing dizziness. Up and up the city walls and the castle, they climbed to the very heights. The horror of the actual locust invasion would be repeated by its sober after effects. For agricultural people, locusts were disaster. Crops and animal feed were destroyed. Those lacking adequate stores or money to buy food could easily starve. Is it any wonder Joel was concerned? Hmm. That just gives you a feel. By the way, if you wonder what they look like, Here's a few pictures. You can get some idea. Here's a, one of these large grasshoppers. Here's a swarm of them that just about covers the, the sky. Here's a group of them just almost totally covering the ground and so forth. Here's another huge swarm down here uh, across the sky. So you get a little idea of what we're talking about. So the book of Joel is describing a invasion of locusts. Yes. And he's comparing the, or he's describing the invasion of locusts as the coming, how the coming of the day of the Lord will be. Is yes. that what the book is doing? Yes. Okay. And, and are we going to reach a conclusion? What does, does this just whole thing of Joel just describe this invasion? No, the invasion is in basically in the first chapter. And then he talks about, okay, what happens when the day of the Lord comes? Is there a spiritual day of the Lord? What's that going to be like? And so forth. I mentioned earlier Deuteronomy 8.15. Look at that for a moment. The children of Israel had temporarily, here they are wandering in the desert. They're just about to the end of their journey. Moses is still their leader. They've had so many lessons about how God is guiding them and directing them and so forth. And what happens? Now Moses is, is telling them about what's, he's basically recounting all the events of their journey. And, and look at, uh, starting from verse 14, make sure that, this is De Deuteronomy 8, make sure that you do not become proud and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from Egypt where you were slaves. He led you through that vast and terrifying desert where there were poisonous snakes and scorpions. In that dry and waterless land, he made water flow out of solid rock for you. So, um, were, the, were the scorpions and the snakes there normally? 
Yes. Yes. Yes, Dennis. Okay, so what does it say? Is, is it Le Leviticus uh, or is it uh, uh, Exodus where he says, I sent the snakes? Well, that's Exodus. It's Exodus. Yeah. So, so no, it's actually it's Numbers. Okay, Numbers. Okay, so we, we have the story told twice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then in one place he says, I sent them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing ambiguous about the statement. statement. Yes. No. That he sent them. Yeah. So then we turn to Deuteronomy, and it says they were already there. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, w w what do we believe? Now, now some like to believe that God sends snakes, and others like to believe that God sent His angel and shut the lion's mouth, uh, or shut the snake's mouth, like like mm -hmm. uh, the lion's mouth was uh, uh, closed in. Uh, Daniel's uh, prison. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so we a, have the two choices. If there's a dam in a river, yes, and somebody comes along and blows up the dam, and then says, "Oh well, but the water was already there." I mean, he he takes responsibility because he did something, even though the water was already there and the flood came. God does the same thing. I mean. The snakes are there, but he pulls back his protection. He blows the dam. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit confused. I don't think we went into the history of the community that Joel was living in. Are these people corrupt and anti-God? Well, are th is it a Jewish community? Yes. And, and can you go a little into yeah. what the community, were they causing, were they... Okay. Not following God, and, and this was a judgment. I mean, what kind of community is this? Okay. Again, remember, there are three possible dates that have been suggested, and they might all be wrong, because we have no way to very specifically nail down the dating of this. I personally believe, and this is in alignment with what is suggested by the ST Bible Commentary, that this particular Joel prophecy happened in the early days of the young King Josiah. And he came right after Manasseh. If you remember, Manasseh was probably the worst king in the north that the southern kingdom ever had. Terrible. Fifty years, you know, he was the one who took the prophet Isaiah and put him in a hollow log and sawed him in two. So there was of, idol worship, there were everything. Fertility cult worship, all this kind of thing. They were doing everything awful. And young Josiah comes along and says, we need, to, we need to clean up our act here. We need to do what the God tells us to do. And at least for a while, there was a reformation. And maybe partly based on this prophecy from Joel. Don't you think that Joel, though, is kind of verifying Job's friends? When they looked at Job, seeing all the things happening to Job, mm -hmm. and saying that, look, at, you've done something wrong because the Lord is punishing you. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it, it would come in line perfectly with Joel if he saw that. Okay, but I here's, mean, here's the, what's the difference between those two stories? Well, if you, keep, if you talk about the beginning of the story where it talks about um, the test, that's one thing. Yeah, no, leave, but leave, if Joel, you look, leave Job 1 and 2 out of it. What's the difference between the story of Job and the story of Joel? Joy, the story of Job and Joy's sto yeah. story. Leaving the first two chapters out. Well, I guess you'll tell me. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the difference is this. None of those people who came and accused Job knew of a single thing that they could actually point at. And Joel, everybody knew all the sins yeah, that they, they were doing. They were doing it, though, because they said they has to be doing something wrong. Well, but it was only in their imagination. They, had, well, they could not point... They yeah, could not, look not at point to a single thing that they had observed with their well, eyes. Watching Job on the on the ash pit scraping off his his sores, sores and stuff. I mean, that's not their imagination. They're no. they're saying two plus two equals four no. here. But well, the formula was wrong. I know, I know it was, but but here they are coming up with some answer. I, I don't and really feel that I have to defend their wrong philosophy. Well, okay. The Bible right. said that Job was a good and righteous man. Yeah. 
and that was does God's it. conclusion. That was and, God's conclusion. Okay, but, but he at, was. You look at what was happening to him. What was happening to him was not happening according to a righteous man. But he was not doing anything wrong. In Joel, you can. It's the community is doing things wrong. Oh well, okay. Okay, You're, we're, we're kind we're, of concluding we're okay, that. Okay, let's get. Back we're going to run out. We're going to run out of time here. So let's let's move on to talk about the day of the Lord. Okay. What are the impl what do you think of in modern times? If I said to you, but we, you didn't know I was studying the book of Job, Joel, and I just said, the day of the Lord is coming, or tell me about the day of the Lord, what would you think of? Christ. The second coming. The second coming. Adventists usually think about the second coming. Armageddon. Armageddon, maybe. End times. End times. Yeah. That was a dispensation, I'd say, probably talk about the Antichrist. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's a well-known psychological phenomenon when something disastrous happens or there's a sudden change in someone's life or what, even a move. That's the time when you can speak to them and you have a much greater chance of actually getting them to change their thinking, to change their lifestyle, to change their paradigm. And that's what God is doing. He knows about that. He's now using this disaster as an opportunity to say, hey, people, think about what happened do we need to change something here? Is it called the shaking? Well, in the future, it will be the shaking. <laughs> yeah. Look so, at some. So every time there's a disaster, we need to think that. Every time the tornado rips through Joplin but leaves Cassville and Springfield alone, and those people need to, my goodness, we, we better correct, but the people in Springfield think, well, we're okay. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't think that's the right interpretation. I think what I'm saying is this. People, whether we like it or not, whether they live in Springfield or whether they live in Joplin or wherever, they're going to ask questions, why did this happen? They're more open now. And that's the something. time when you can say, well, let's think about some possibilities. Well, also when disaster happens, you gain a new sense of priorities. Mm -hmm. My family was saved. The house can be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And so... At least we came out alive. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what they mm -hmm. say. When yeah. the earthquake happened in Haiti, when Pat Robinson say, oh, well, this happened to them because in 1804, because Haiti was the first black country to gain liberty, uh, uh, the second in the Western Hemisphere uh, behind America. And so he said uh, it was through the help of the devil that they were able to uh, gain their liberty, a uh, group of mm -hmm. a black nation. And But the thing, uh, yeah, he said that. He <laughs> said that on television. He said okay. that. He said that's why, you know, they're paying now for that. But the thing he didn't understand, some, are, some things are, happen naturally because for a century they're taking coal. They're taking and taking from the earth because they burn a lot of wood and burn a lot of coal. And it's been proven scientifically that doing that without stopping, without ever replacing anything, caused seismic, you know, uh, actions to happen. And it, it's not just everything is not God punishing. It's yeah. people through their own action make things happen as well. Mm -hmm. Look at some of the verses. Look at Joel 1.15. <laughs> the day of the Lord is near, the day when the Almighty brings destruction. What terror that day will bring. What does that sound like? Mm -hmm. Try another verse. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet, sound the alarm on Zion, God's sacred hill. Tremble, people of Judah, the day of the Lord is coming soon. It will be a dark and gloomy day, a black and cloudy day. The great army of locusts advances like darkness spreading over the mountains. There's never been anything like it, and there never will be again. Amos says the same thing, but mm -hmm. they seem to be different. One different, is talking, difference. yeah. About, different situation. Yeah. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord thunders commands to his army. The troops that obey him are mighty and many. How terrible is the day of the Lord? Who will survive it? Uh, was Joel the first fire and brimstone preacher? He seems to be threatening Maybe. the people. Maybe. <laughs> the sun will be darkened, he says in verse 31, and the moon will turn red as blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever heard oh, that from an Adventist? Next, look at the next verse. But all, all who, who ask, ask the Lord for help will be saved. I, I prefer reading that. <laughs> Deuter Deuteronomy was long before Joel. Yes. 
And Deuteronomy says, if you do this, this will happen. If you don't, I'm giving you some hell and brimfire spe- uh, ceremonies in here. Good it point. was way back. Good point, good point. Is, is Joel um, mentioning specific things are going to happen, or is he saying it's going to be like this? The things which you cherish, the things which are important to you, it's all going to... It's all going to, to go away. The future things he mentions very specifically are, are about three or four. The sun is going to be darkened. The moon is going to be turned to blood. But he also talks about something which we haven't mentioned yet. And that's that old men are be, going to be dreaming, dreaming dreams and young men are going to be having visions. He, and women. Furthermore, I guess there's one more thing. And that's chapter 3, verse 14. Thousands and thousands are in the valley of judgment. A time of judgment is coming. And that's when people are deciding whether they're for God or against mm. Him, believe in God or don't believe. Mm. I guess it depends on which side of the judgment you're looking at. You can say they're making a decision, a judgment for or against God, or it might be the other way around. God is up there making decisions about for or against you know, people true. down here. Well, well, are you going to accept the mark of the beast or not? Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. Let's look at a couple of verses that might give us some clue about that. One group of people are, are described in Isaiah 25, 9. When it happens, everyone will say, He is our God, we have put our trust in Him, and He has rescued us. He is the Lord, we have put our trust in Him, and now we are happy and joyful because He has saved us. That's one side. What's the other side? Call for the mountains and rocks to fall on us. And that's Revelation 6, 16 and 17, right? Okay, let me read a couple more comments. One of the central themes of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. We've already looked at a couple of verses. This language describes a period of time in which God comes down, quote, in a dramatic way to bring wrath and judgment on the wicked and salvation to the righteous. God is Lord of time. There is no period that is not the day of the Lord in a general sense. But at times, God enters the space-time arena to assert in bold, dramatic ways that He is in control. The Day of the Lord is a major theme of Old Testament prophecy. Thirteen of the sixteen prophets address this subject of the Day of the Lord. The concept of the Day of the Lord probably originated with the conquest of Canaan, a conquest which was in fact the Lord's war, and we know about that. That is a day of judgment for the wicked Canaanites. The day of the Lord is not an isolated phenomenon or a single event in human history. Periods in Israel's early history and later history, the coming of Jesus and his second advent, are all called the day of the Lord in Scripture. The predictions of a coming day of the Lord can be fulfilled in a number of different ways, a number of different events. The invasion of locusts and the historic events of the life of Joel was the day of the Lord for them. But the day of the wrath and deliverance that soon fell on Judah in the Babylonian invasion was also the day of the Lord. While most references speak of future events, five biblical texts describe the day of the Lord in terms of past judgments. Isaiah 22, 1 to 14, Jeremiah 46, 2 to 20, 12, 2 to 12, Lamentations 1, 1 to 2, 22, and Ezekiel 13, 1 to 9. So it's not always future events that are the day of the Lord. These texts reflect circumstances of military defeat, tragedy, and judgment. Such events may have stimulated the development of the prophetic concept of a future day or time of judgment for the disobedient of Israel and all the nations. However, the day of the Lord is not just a day of wrath and judgment on the disobedient. In some contexts, it also includes deliverance and restoration for the righteous. The day of the Lord speaks not only of future judgment, but of future hope, prosperity, and blessing. For example, Isaiah 4, 2 to 6, Hosea 2, 18 to 23, Amos 9, 11 to 15, and Micah 4, 6 to 8. Joel reveals that this day is to be heralded by heavenly phenomena. Phenomena. And just look at those verses. Look at Joel 2, 30 and 31. I will give warnings of that day. In the sky and on the earth, there will be bloodshed, fire, clouds of smoke, the sun will be darkened, The moon will turn red as blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So are you saying that Joel is 
saying days of the Lord can be at certain events, like maybe in the fiery furnace was the day of the Lord for the three Jewish sure. uh, boys that were in the furnace, or men. And the day of the Lord then is also being spoken of as when the second coming. The great day of the Lord is going to be at the second coming. And he, Joel, is Joel just sort of intermingling mm -hmm. these He's different concepts? Them all so together. when we say the day of the Lord, it doesn't necessarily have to be the second coming. No, it, it may be used and may have and has been and may be used in, in connection to some specific event, some disaster, or some great thing that happened at a certain time. Well, but, any t time you think about yeah. Jesus, you can kind of use that. This is the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I mean, any time you, you're thinking about him. About eight, so, AD 70, the destruction yeah. of Jerusalem. Exactly. It will be a day of divine destruction on the nations that have persecuted Israel and on the rebellious and disobedient of Israel. Yet it will also be a time of deliverance and unprecedented blessing for God's people. And that's a comment from the Nelson Study Bible. And there's a additional material similar to that in the <coughs> SDA Bible commentary. So, what about Peter's speech where he quotes from Joel extensively? Let's just look at that for a moment. Acts 2, 1 to 21. Is he making a correct use of this idea? When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious people who had come from every country of the world. Now that would be the Mediterranean world of those days. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. They were all excited because each one of them heard the believers speaking in his or her own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, these people who are talking like this are all Galileans. How is it then that all of us hear them speaking in our own native languages? We are from, and now notice this collection, Parthia, Media, and Elam, those, those are from the east. From Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, from Pontus and Asia, from Phrygia and Pamphylia, from Egypt and the regions of Libya near Cyrene. That's North Africa, that's uh, South Asia, Middle East. Some of us are from Rome. Both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism, and some of us are from Crete and Arabia. Yet all of us hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things that God has done. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers, saying, ah, these people are drunk. <laughs> then Peter stood up with the other 11 apostles in a loud voice, began to speak to the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me and let me tell you what this means. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. Clearly, Peter knew about Joel. This is what I will do in the last days, God says. I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will proclaim my message. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will have dreams. Yes, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will proclaim my message. I will perform miracles in the sky above and wonders on the earth below. There will be blood, fire, and thick smoke. The sun will be darkened and the moon will turn red as blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And then, whoever calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. All coming straight from the book of Joel. But the only part from the book of Joel that was happening were the people speaking in dreams no, and no, so no, on no, and so no, forth. No, there no, was no. no earthquakes. No, there was, no, no, The sun no, wasn't no. darkened. The moon wasn't darkened. No, <laughs> you're, you're, there, there was an earthquake. It was yes. when Jesus died. Yeah. There was an when, earthquake. When he, when he was resurrected. Yeah. When he was resurrected. And as far as the moon turning the blood, there was a solar, uh, a lunar eclipse that happened, well, it happened All of which April, is fine, but April 3, A.D. 33. So okay, but that Jesus, could... Jesus died in the spring of A.D. 31 and not in 33. Well, now, I, okay. Um. <laughs> when Joel wrote this, did Joel think he was writing of his day? 
did he think he was writing of? Uh, be, he Joel, didn't. He okay. didn't know that there was going to be a second coming. It's it's so, time to talk about types. No, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Isn't it possible that all these people that were watching all this happening actually witnessed those descriptions happening some way, somehow? Yeah, sure. They did. They see the grasshoppers. Absolutely. They no, saw no. The I'm talking about. I'm talking about Peter. Talking about the people that were accusing these people of being drunk. Yeah. All the things that Peter mentioned there. Mm -hmm. They probably saw those things happen as a sign, uh, pointing out what was happening during that time when people were, were getting the Spirit at that time. Okay, so what happened there was the Holy Spirit came down looking like tongues of fire and people started speaking in different languages, clearly speaking in different languages. There was no immediate earthquake at that point. There was an earthquake seven weeks before that uh, but there was which, no which there was no the day of the Lord yeah could be the day of the Lord right yeah but so then it's already happened and it's not going to happen now, hold on now so that's the question 2,000 years later we're still talking about the coming day of the Lord are we are we fooling ourselves well, how many, we just talked about all the possible days of the Lord that could be. Why are we now saying there's only one? No, 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 no. We need to talk about types and antitypes. In ancient times, there are many examples of the fact that something happened, for example, this plague in the days of Joel, and, and he says this, and God says through him, this is going to be a type. This is going to be a little example, a little hint of something that's coming in the future. And he gives some hints of what those things, the sun being darkened, the moon turned to blood, men prophesying, women prophesying, dreaming dreams, all those things. He's saying what happened here in our day is a hint of what's coming. Now we're running out of time here, but there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit at this time we believe Peter told the truth that he was that this was an early fulfillment of of the prophecy of Joel. Will there be, could there be another much greater fulfillment of the prophet of Joel, prophecy of Joel at the end times? And what do we call that? April talismatic principle. Okay, we call it the latter rain. <laughs> let's 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 stick with it with the easy words. Okay, there's going to be a shaking and there's going to be a latter rain coming. And you and I need to be a part of it. See you next week.